Ladies and gentlemen, very good morning to you all. It's very nice to see you all here for this occasion of the launch of the 2017 edition of the Global Innovation Index, which is the actual, actually the 10th uh, such um, edition. And uh, my colleagues here, uh, who have been introduced by uh, Sama already, uh, Sumitra and Bruno, uh, will give you much more detail. I would like to make just a few uh, opening remarks. Uh, why do we do this and what is the GII? Well, it measures essentially, essentially uh, the capacity and performance of innovation across 130 economies uh, in the world. Uh, and why is that important to measure? Well, I give you four quick reasons. Uh, economic growth. We're living in a period of sustained sluggish in economic growth, uh, and it has been conventional wisdom for a long time now that innovation is a major driver of economic growth. So uh, looking at the capacity to innovate and innovation performance is more important now than ever. Uh, secondly, uh, as the particular theme chosen for this year, namely feeding the world, agriculture, indicates innovation is our major tool for addressing the significant social challenges that confront the world, such as feeding a growing population with competing uses uh, for land resources. Innovation is uh, the way out and as a number of the essays uh, that are contained in this year's edition indicate innovation, uh, agriculture is likely to experience significant change driven by innovation in the coming years. Thirdly, innovation is a measure of a, of a country's capacity to compete internationally. Uh, so what we are measuring here is central to economic performance and capacity to perform uh, and to compete internationally. And finally, technology is the great differentiator in the world, or at least one of the great differentiators in the world. And innovation is at the heart of that. So it is very important for countries to have available a tool which enables them to benchmark their own capacity and performance against other countries' capacity and performance and to see in what respects uh, they may be able to uh, improve their performance. Uh, there are a number of results that my colleagues uh, will go through. Uh, let me just make a, a couple of remarks about them. Of course, everyone focuses on the rankings, and the rankings are important, uh, but the rankings are not everything. Uh, but what the rankings show us, of course, is that there is continued uh, stability in the top 2025 20, uh, in the rankings on the Global Innovation um, Index. Switzerland is the gold medalist once again, and that's seven years running, so that's quite an outstanding performance. Uh, in amongst the middle-income countries, we see China moving once again, it moved into the top 25 last year as the first middle income country in the first 25 and it moves up to number 22 this year. Uh, one final remark, we have uh, in the discussions following the uh, launch of the GII each year, we get a persistent question which is, well, how is it that the United States, for example, comes in at uh, number four, when in the popular mind at any rate, and in many, on many of the measures, the United States is the innovation leader in the world? Or how is it that China is only number 25 or number 22 this year? Uh, and this is an effect of an index uh, on, in particular, large and diverse economies. So if you look at the rankings, you do see that a number of the highest performers uh, tend to be small, homogenous economies where an even performance across the economy with respect to all of the complex 
number of measures that go into determining innovation capacity is rather more easy than in the case of a large and diverse economy. Uh, so uh, to address this particular line of inquiry, uh, we have started within WIPO uh, a, uh, an investigation into the occurrence of clusters or innovation hotspots around the world. Uh, and we do re release the first results in this regard this year. <clears throat> Let me say that those results, unlike the GII, are based on very specific data relating to patent applications. Uh, and that, they are very interesting uh, in themselves because they tend to identify the clusters. The clusters become self-identifying. Uh, and there we have a different sets of results. We have to Tokyo, Yokohama coming out on top, followed by Shenzhen, Hong Kong, followed by San Jose, San Francisco, followed by Seoul, followed by Osaka, Kyoto in clusters. The Global Innovation Index is a far more comprehensive measure of innovation capacity and performance. This is the start of one particular component in the Global Innovation Index, namely looking at uh, clusters or innovation hotspots, not in terms of countries, but in terms of particular geographical uh, localities, and it is based on much more limited data. Thank you very much, and good morning, everyone. So it's my pleasure to say a few introductory remarks about the Global Innovation Index as Francis mentioned earlier, this is the 10th year of the index, and these 10 years would not have been possible without the support of many uh, in the audience out here. I wanted to acknowledge especially my colleague Shasha from the WIPO, who is uh, one of the co-editors of the report, and also the support of Carsten, who is the chief economist of WIPO, and we also have our knowledge partners from CII, represented Dr. Noshat Forbes, and Strategy and represented by Volker Stack uh, here, so thank you very much for your support. I wanted to use my few minutes to give you a sense of some overall trends that we have seen in the Innovation Index results over 10 years. What is important to keep in mind is there is no other comparable base of data that exists that looks at innovation broadly defined across countries over time. So we have the privilege of having this unique set of data over 10 years. and I wanted to set the, set the context in terms of what are some overall trends, and then my colleague Bruno will go into more the in-depth results for this particular year. So what do we see as some important trends over the last 10 years? So what we have seen, of course, is in the last 10 years, a sharp decline in investments and in R&D's expenditure triggered mainly by the global financial crisis in 2008-2009. Prior to that, we had fairly high levels of investment across the world. Just after the crisis, the investments decreased dramatically and then they moved up. And clearly what has happened is they have moved up, but they haven't actually caught up to the levels, pre-crisis levels. And what we see overall is if the world wants to maintain a steady and a high level of growth in the economies, we need to ramp up the level of investments in R&D across the world, both in rich countries and also in developing economies. And for a certain period of time, private sector investments made up for the fall or the losses in government investments. But what is of some concern to us is more recently, this year and the previous year, we are seeing some declining trends even in the private sector investments. And this hasn't been compensated correctly or adequately by rises in government expenditure. So there is a need out here for governments around the world and private sectors around the world to increase investments, especially R&D investments, if we want to continue with a healthy state of growth in the world around us. The second overall message that we see is there is an innovation divide in the world. It's undeniable. The set of countries that are at the top of the innovation rankings over the last 10 years continue to be at the top. 
And this gap is not necessarily decreasing on the whole. So the gap exists and continues to exist. And of course, the reasons for it are multiple. But at the same time, what we see are some hopeful signs of a more global base and emer innovation emerging. As mentioned earlier by Director General, countries like China have moved up dramatically. So China is now ranked 22 this year, and over the years has ranked and moved up consistently. India is increasing its progress, and this year is ranked at number 60 in the top half. And we see other countries, a range of countries around the world, who are occupying positions of significance in the top of the list. So even though there are some examples of countries moving out here, upwards, the message really is that developing economies have to focus on policies and investment strategies to decrease the gap with the rich economies. Because this gap is a real gap, yet at the same time, we see examples of countries that are successfully closing the gap. So we need more of those successful closure of the gaps across the world. Now, we also see in terms of overall regional trends, a rise of an innovation powerhouse in general in Asia. This is not surprising per se, given the rise of China and what we have talked about China, but one should not forget that Japan continues to be a regional economic an innovation powerhouse. We see new Asian tigers emerging like Vietnam and Thailand and Malaysia. And we see the rise of India, which is doing increasingly well along many metrics. Now, as we see some more collaborations across these Asian countries emerge and take more concrete forms of collaboration and manufacturing, other kinds of global supply chains, our expectation is that Asia will start emerging as an even more dominant home for innovation in the years ahead. Now, in terms of other areas that have lagged behind traditionally, we know that Africa has been an area of some concern. But again, the data shows a hopeful trend on that front where we see a gradual but steady rise in innovation results in Africa. And certainly, some countries are doing quite well. And in our innovation research, we identify countries that perform at a higher level as compared to their peers at the same GDP per capita levels. And every year, we term these countries innovation achievers. And what we note is that this group of countries which are innovation achievers has been increasing every year. And this year, we have 17 of them and includes several countries from Africa, such as Rwanda, Uganda, Mozambique, Malawi, Senegal, and others. So we see some positive stories of examples of Africa as a region moving and improving, yet it also emphasizes the need for emerging economies as a whole to focus much more on innovation policies for the reasons that I mentioned earlier, for competitiveness, for creation of wealth, and essentially competing in, a, in, 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 in the global world. Let me at this point pass on my, the flow microphone to my colleague Bruno, who will go more in depth in this year's results. Thank you, Sumitra. <coughs> Thank you, Francis. Good morning, everybody. Um, so you have seen the press release. You've heard what both uh, the Director General and uh, Sumitra Dutta just said about the rankings. I have little to add. Indeed, uh, we have Switzerland in the first position for the seventh year in a row, which is quite remarkable. It's something we are not seeing in the, uh, uh, any other major global index we can think of, the same champion for such a long period of time. Um, so we all continue to learn from the experience of Switzerland. Um, last year, uh, the press and the media uh, insisted very much on the symbolic entry of China in the top 25. This trend is being pursued. China goes up another three notches this year. And um, we see, indeed, as Sumitra just mentioned, uh, an innovation powerhouse being somehow revived or reborn in, in Asia. So there are interesting trends and novelties in that. We still have stability at the top. We still see uh, Europe dominating the rankings with uh, eight European countries in the top 10 uh, and 14 in the top 20. Uh, we also see interesting changes in the middle of the ranking, between 30, 30 and 50, roughly, 
with some spectacular progressions like Vietnam uh, plus 12. Uh, we also have other countries like United Arab Emirates, Croatia, Romania, each moving up plus six. So things are moving somewhat, somehow in the middle. It remains, as uh, Sumitra mentioned, that the divide is still there and deserves all our attention. Um, this year uh, is also uh, the, the year for which we chose food and agriculture as a theme. And uh, there are various reasons for that. We thought we needed a, a theme for the 10th anniversary that would remind all of us that innovation is not just high technology sectors. That if innovation doesn't touch the majority of people on this planet, it is not actually playing the full role it could play. And that food and agriculture was indeed the uh, most ancient activity of mankind, uh, and that it would be wrong to think that it's not a sector affected by innovation. Actually, it's quite the opposite. Um, we are heading to a world where the planet, with its limited resources, will have to feed roughly 10, 10 billion people. Um, if you look at the supply side and demand side, on the supply side you have the necessity to bring enough calories, enough food for everybody, and on the other side you have not only to uh, use available resources to do that, but do it in a conservative way we need to limit and reduce the pressure on the use of land, the use of energy, as the Director General mentioned before. To do that, innovation is absolutely key. Uh, there's no way, with the resources we have and the challenge we have ahead of us, that if we left everything as they are today, we would be able to solve that equation. And this year's report shows through its uh, uh, chapters, in particular, what we got from our various contributors from all around the world, that good signs are appearing. Uh, digital agriculture is rapidly spreading. The use of drones, uh, remote sensing, satellite-based systems, uh, all of that is actually being increasingly used, including in emerging and poorer countries. That's a good sign. But by itself, it will not, it will not solve the hunger problem. We need to move from digital agriculture to smart agriculture. And smart digital agriculture altogether is the key. What is the difference? The difference is that we are not looking just at technology and new crops. We're looking at ways to improve distribution systems, to get the food to where it is most needed. Transportation, trade, regulation all have a role to play. And this is where we also need innovative. And this might be the um, a concluding point looking back at 10 years of GII, um, which is it's a a fundamental message we tried to uh, make as clear as possible since the very first edition <clears throat> of the report. Uh, innovation is not just technological innovation. Innovation is a mindset. Innovation has to do more and more with new business models, with new ways of organizing input into valuable outputs. And if we can help in our uh, modest way to contribute to inform this debate, to equip various decision makers, private and public, to make the right decisions about innovation, uh, this would not have been wasted time. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take your questions. If you can please identify yourself before asking the question and switch off your microphone when you're done. Tom Miles from Reuters. Um, if the European Union was one country, how would it uh, rank? on the tables. And also, can you say what do you anticipate will be the Trump and the Brexit effects on innovation in uh, the United States and Britain? Thanks very much. Okay, I'll, I'll, we haven't done a ranking looking at combining all European nations into one. But as you see in the ranking, Europe does extremely well. So you have Switzerland, Sweden, Netherlands, United Kingdom, Denmark, Finland, Germany, Ireland, all in the top 10. So there's a very strong sense of innovation achievement amongst many European countries. And you know, it's a good exercise to do for the future, perhaps combine and see how they would, come, how they would, how they would sort of map up as one combined entity. But right now, what I would say is that looking at countries individually, and there are many European countries doing extremely well right in the top 10. 
Uh, let me just make a couple of observations on the second part of your question. Uh, as is apparent from what uh, Sumitra has just said, innovation is a very central strategy uh, for the European Union. So I think that as far as Brexit is concerned, uh, it is obviously in the interests of both parties that they come to an arrangement uh, in respect of Brexit, which respects all of the complexity of the interrelationships that exist between the United Kingdom and other European partners, and which have developed uh, as a consequence of the centrality of the policy of innovation to the European Union, and which have developed also because Britain itself is an innovation power. Great Britain is an innovation power. So uh, I would say uh, we can't make any observation on that other than to say that uh, it is in both parties' interests to be able to preserve the sorts of relationship that have uh, contributed to uh, Europe as a whole, being, including the United Kingdom, being uh, high innovation performers. As far as the United States of America is concerned, I think, uh, again, it's rather early days to be able to make any observations on that. I think we do notice that uh, in the proposed budget presented by the President, uh, their uh, research and development expenditure in the public sector, uh, it is proposed, would be reduced by 10%. Uh, that is a proposal only. Uh, obviously, uh, public research and development in the United States of America is an exceptionally important component of the whole e innovation ecosystem in the United States. Uh, so there are certain signs, but um, those, it's, I think, would be premature to make any really firm observations uh, about uh, the administration's policy as a whole in respect of innovation. Just to, to add on, on that, the, um, on the European side, I think Brexit was a wake-up call. Um, uh, we said last year that uh, regarding innovation, but more generally, that the future emerging and developing countries uh, have to invent the future. And uh, uh, older uh, economies, such as Europe, uh, have to uh, reinvent their models. Uh, so the wake-up call may lead to reinventing a few things about, about Europe. At least that's the, that's the hope. And now regarding, as uh, uh, the Director General just said, about uh, what happened and the effects on innovation about what happened in the UK and in the US, I would be tempted to make the same uh, answer that was made by Chu and Lai when the French ambassador asked him in the 60s, what are the uh, most important effects of the French Revolution? And Chu and Lai's answer it was uh, too early to say. Just, sorry, just to follow up on, on Brexit, I see that the UK has already gone down the rankings a couple. Is that related to Brexit? Why, why, why else? Thanks. So most of the data collected out here was prior to Brexit. So in effect, the data does not reflect any impact post-Brexit. And it would be completely speculative at this point to draw any association between the two. Hi, uh, Ben Simon from AFP. Just going to follow up on what Tom was going after a little bit. Uh, you make national rankings. Uh, but presumably uh, exchange of ideas across borders, international commerce is part of innovation. Uh, WTO and others remind us every single day about the threat of rising protectionism uh, and what that could do to the global economy. Presumably you have similar concerns for innovation, that as countries leading innovators bunker in, be it the US or the United Kingdom, you're going to see less innovative ideas triggering through exchange. I, I wouldn't draw the conclusion, but I would share your concern uh, about the subject matter. So uh, we have emphasized in this particular context in the past the internationalization of science and technology and the relationships that have developed in, in respect of innovation, just as you have uh, suggested, across the world, um, which are essentially international in character. Now, will the tendencies that are out there for protectionism have an impact on that? 
again, uh, regrettably, for, perhaps for, for today's uh, purposes, it's too early to say, but it's something that we should be very concerned about. Uh, and we are studying, Carsten Fink is just uh, down the table from you, our chief economist, we are studying uh, global value chains, intellectual property and innovation, uh, and that will be the subject of a World Intellectual Property Report which will be released in November this year. Uh, so we hope that that will shed a little more light on this, but I think we should be extremely vigilant that the internationalization of innovation, which has had benefits for many countries, all countries, is not impacted adversely by protectionism. Just a footnote to, to that. Uh, I will go one step beyond uh, what uh, the Director General just said. I not only share your concerns, I share your implied conclusions. Um, there's no surprise that uh, among the first to uh, actually worry about protectionist signals given by the new US administration were Silicon Valley entrepreneurs. Uh, because they are the first to know uh, how much they owe to diversity, uh, to the fact that people from all over the world have converged towards Californian universities and Silicon Valley as entrepreneurs. The proportion of uh, startups created by people who are not US national is significant to, uh, for people to take notice. Uh, and there would be many other examples showing that indeed uh, protectionist threat could be a threat to uh, innovation and to the quality of innovation. Um, it's also important to, um, to keep in mind, uh, and that's also something that uh, Francis Gurry highlighted before, it's a surprise to many people that uh, you know, the, the US should be only number four, number five, number six, depending on the years, um, and that smaller economies uh, would rank higher. And there's no secret about that. If you're a smaller economy, you have to be an open economy. You have no choice, uh, especially in these times of globalization. So openness uh, is and will continue to be a critical factor of success in innovation. Yes, uh, good morning. Uh, I was wondering, uh, I'm a bit uh, curious to find out how come Russia doesn't appear anywhere in the top 20 given it's a world leader in so many areas in research. Does that mean you don't include government-funded research or defence R&D? Let, let me sort of, you know, as was mentioned earlier, the whole premise behind the Innovation Index is to look at innovation as a broad-based capability in the country and there are a variety of different elements that go into the composition of the score of innovation, including institutions, human capital, infrastructure, market sophistication, business sophistication, and they are each defined by a whole variety of variables. So if you look at Russia's ranking on each one of these dimensions, uh, they're not necessarily you know, in the top 20. So I'll just give an example on institutions, is ranked 73 on infrastructure is ranked 62nd, on market sophistication is ranked number 60, and on some of the outputs, on the knowledge technology outputs are ranked number 45, and creative outputs are ranked number 62. So the actual data does not necessarily show that Russia is performing in the top 20, 30 globally. And clearly Russia, despite as many strengths, has areas where it should be investing and in trying to actually improve more. Let me just add uh, two comments, uh, John, if I may. First, uh, innovation is the introduction of new products and services to the economy. So we're not focused on the military, uh, uh, first of all. Um, and uh, secondly, I think that uh, the Russian authorities are highly, con I can't speak for them obviously, but they're highly conscious of uh, the need to focus on innovation as a strategy. And that can be seen, for example, uh, with respect to the development of Skolkovo as an endeavor to create uh, a cluster uh, of importance for innovation and a cluster which will enable the very strong tradition in science that has always existed in Russia, in the Soviet Union and post-Soviet Union, 
to be able to find its translation through to the economy. I've got a follow-up question with reference to the theme this year being agriculture. Um, to what extent do you consider the introduction of GMOs in agriculture as a, an innovation step, uh, given that there is a trend by the consumers going the other way towards bioproducts? <clears throat> yes, the, this is the, uh, uh, one of the, the questions which is addressed through some of the, uh, the chapters. Uh, clearly, there is a, there is a debate uh, about GMOs. Uh, there are debates about other aspects of innovation in food and agriculture. Uh, it boils down to uh, uh, what I called earlier making the best use of available resources. Um, if indeed uh, uh, some new products uh, are polluting or poisoning uh, the, um, our environment, we, uh, we are not going to gain anything in, uh, in innovation. Uh, clearly, the debate is, is open on, on GMOs. There, is a, there are high stakes around it. Uh, a strong argument um, relates to uh, how do we feed the people, whether without uh, genetically modifying uh, the seeds we are able to do that. Clearly, that's one side of the equation. The other one is how do we protect the growth of the seeds and it's the fertilizer uh, and nutrient kind of side of the equation. Uh, it's an open debate. It's a debate in which civil society needs to be involved uh, so that all the elements are put on the, uh, on the table. Uh, but clearly, uh, the experiments we have seen around the, the planet point at ways in which this can be done properly. So uh, finding out the best practices and making sure those are the ones adopted as opposed to the worst practices would be part of the innovation game in agriculture. Just let me add one comment, uh, John. I think it's an area to watch very, very closely, particularly with the introduction of CRISPR technology. We will see a lot of activity with respect to... Uh, I'm sorry, which technology? CRISPR. CRISPR. CRISPR-Cas9. We will see a lot of activity as that's... Uh, it's, at the moment, it's the main applications uh, or explorations are with respect to the human genome, but it's equally applicable to plant genomes. Hi, William New at Intellectual Property Watch. Um, <clears throat> when I think of rankings, it seems like uh, it could be considered a sort of zero sum, uh, that if one is gaining, another is falling. And yet uh, there was a clear message that there's a, a need for the world collectively to invest and, and um, f concentrate on innovation in order to benefit all economies and the global economy. Uh, how does an individual country set its targets that would be appropriate for its growth factor? Does it work with the partners that you have? Do, do the three partners that have produced the report uh, you know, advise and, and help to construct, uh, you know, specific targets on different elements of the, of the whole. And then my only other little question was, um, when I think of Africa and agriculture, as that was a topic here today, I think, um, what about the local farmer who has come up with a, you know, a local innovation that is some little practice that is, that is uh, used at that very local level, but isn't a sort of corporate level or commercial level activity. Does that sort of a thing get captured here? Thank you. Maybe I'll just answer the first part of the question. Um, so the rankings are relative rankings, and clearly, you know, there's a relative shift across countries as countries improve or they change their scores. But the rankings are also based on absolute scores absolute scores. So, you know, there are variables with actual data values that are computed, and then we have a ranked order of the various total scores, and then we give a rank. And what is important for us is to see the gap in the scores. So if you look at the rich countries, the leading countries, they typically score in absolute terms a higher value on the various indicators as compared to the emerging economies in many cases, and the report outlines the gaps very clearly. 
So what we hope is that emerging economies are able to invest in the right policies such that they're able to close the gap in actual scores because the actual magnitudes of the improvements are important at the same time. You also asked a very interesting question about how does it translate into individual country actions and policies. And let me just share with you one anecdote. You know, many countries of the last few years have chosen to use the Global Innovation Index as a guiding principle for setting their country's innovation strategies and policies. And one country that is working quite actively on it right now is India. We have Mr. Noshat Forbes from uh, CII out here with us, and he can comment also at some later point on this. India has chosen to create an India Innovation Index that basically uses the framework of the Global Innovation Index, because the framework is a framework that really applies to all countries, but then customizes it with variables and strategic objectives linked to India per se. And right now, the various Indian organizations, the key ones involved are Niti Aayog, the Central, Central Government Planning Commission, uh, CII, which is the Industry Confederation Body, and a Department of Industry Promotion, Industrial Promotion, DIPP. They're working together with WIPO, with Cornell University, and with the World Economic Forum to try to create a state-level innovation index. And this will be used to benchmark different states and to create the sense of transparency and competition across different states that will help them to both A, improve themselves, and also bring in a healthy level of competition for investments across the various states. So it's one example of a large country actually using it to create something localized, and we have other examples of other countries using the Innovation Index as a guide for their own investments. William, if I may uh, go back to the first, very first part of your, your question, I think, um, if I may say, you've put your finger on something which is extremely important. You have uh, a tension, I think, between two things. On the one hand, as we spoke about before, the internationalization uh, that has occurred, well, globalization in general, but internationalization of science and uh, technology and the relationships of science and technology and innovation. And on the other hand, the fact that uh, innovation is, uh, represents the competitive advantage of an individual enterprise or indeed an economy. And that's a tension. And it's a tension between, on the one hand, if you like, uh, collaboration and on the other hand, competition. Uh, and I think that that tension, well, in the views of some, for example, in an article published uh, several years ago now, the Globally Integrated Enterprise by Samuel Parmesano, who was the CEO at the time and chairman of IBM, uh, he said this will be the great tension, one of the great tensions, geopolitical tensions of the 21st century. Uh, and it's why, he said, intellectual property will become such an important element, because how do you define within a collaborative relationship the rights and obligations with respect to the knowledge products that emerge from the collaborative relationship and essentially you do so through intellectual property. So uh, it's a mechanism for determining, if you like, uh, the uh, or managing the tension between collaboration and competition. No, the same. Uh, just about the, the last part of your question, William, about the small farmer. Um, the, uh, indeed, that's something which is very difficult to, to measure. We spoke uh, a few years ago in our own internal uh, uh, debate about frugal innovation and how do you detect what is really happening on the ground, which can have a significant impact, especially in sectors like agriculture. And what Sumitra just described of a country like India going to the local level, going to see what's happening at the local level, what is uh, being tracked this year uh, in the, the chapter of the report on clusters goes in that direction. That is, the closer we get to the ground, the more uh, granularity we're going to get about this data. And finally, about your initial point, I'm not sure I agree with the fact that we should look at the rankings as a, a zero-sum game. If somebody moves up, another moves down. One of the messages we try to uh, push through the report is that innovation is a positive-sum game that if one country becomes a better innovator, somehow everybody else benefits. 
Um, so I know that Francis is keen on saying that IP should not just be intellectual property, but also in, the, in innovation promotion. Uh, I would say it's also about inclusive prosperity. So we should work on that as well. Sorry, just a very quick question. Is there a table somewhere that lays out the 2017 overall rankings and the 2016 so we can compare them? Because I've been looking for it, can't, can't find it, and it would be useful. Thanks. So if you have the report with you, there should be right up front a section called rankings. So well, it's on page uh, 18 and 19 initially, the first up front. Yes, uh, I'd like to follow up on what Francis was saying, uh, quoting this former IBM executive about geopolitical tensions. You mentioned earlier that R&D by governments, which is classified, is not part of your research. Um, isn't that a huge gap in your analysis? Because we have seen in the past so many products that were classified as defense-related products, whether they were custom-made electronics, when they were declassified, became mass consumer items. So there seems to be a gap because the United States and many other countries, China, are spending huge amounts in this area, and there's potential spin-offs, not to mention dual-use situations where companies are involved in defense but also have um, civilian arms like aerospace. Well, look, I'm sure everyone's got uh, something to, to contribute on, on this one. But um, if you say it is uh, made a civilian product, at that stage it does enter the economy as an innovation, doesn't it? So it is measured at that stage when it does become a, 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 an economic commodity, as it were. Uh, but uh, in terms of overall government expenditure, yes, on research and development, yes, this is measured. And then it has different components, which are, of which defence is, is one. So in that respect, it is captured uh, in the overall public expenditure on research and development. As to the products, well, uh, many patent laws around the world have a provision for secret patents. So uh, they don't become published. Uh, if a particular application has, in the view of the country concern, a specific military application, it uh, goes by a different path than the ordinary path of publication. And that different path is generally known as secret patents, and there are many major economies that have this provision exactly. So by definition, you cannot measure it and you cannot trace it. Uh, however, there is also uh, other military technology which um, is, as you've said, first of all, has civilian applications, and secondly, there is a market uh, for better or for worse, for arms, which uh, also uh, functions. But we don't get into that in this particular exercise. I wasn't thinking only of arms. I was thinking of civil aviation, the 30-year dispute between the United States and Europe on Airbus versus Boeing has this dual-use debate at the heart of it. Sorry to ask another one. Um, how would you describe in a, I, there's many factors in this very sophisticated uh, methodology. How do you describe how intellectual property broadly uh, is, is assessed, how it, and then specifically patents? How can I compare patent filing or patent quality even with ranking or uh, progress in innovation? And then a, a separate question is, is there anything in here, I guess I haven't looked in the past, I haven't thought of this, uh, that relates to, I guess what I would just say, counterfeiting and piracy issues? You know, is there, are you sort of deducted or docked uh, some points for uh, 
problems in this area, so to speak, or activity in this area. So, so I think the uh, relationship between intellectual property, uh, what we're measuring here is innovation, capacity, and performance. The relationship between intellectual property and innovation uh, capacity <coughs> and performance is, uh, I think, multiple. First of all, uh, it is one of the elements of a policy setting which contribute uh, to giving a country a, uh, a, an enhanced capacity to innovate. Uh, in intellectual property is. It's an encouragement to investment in innovation. Uh, and secondly, I think uh, intellectual property is the mechanism uh, or the chief mechanism, one of the chief mechanisms by which the advantage of innovation is captured by an individual enterprise and commercialized. So whether it relates to functionality, which is essentially patents, appearance of a product, and let's remember that that, of course, is a big differentiator in the market, which is designs, or reputation and image in the market, which is trademarks, all of these elements, uh, the intellectual property captures the specific competitive advantage that is conferred by innovation for an individual enterprise to be able to maximize its, uh, its position uh, and its advantage as a consequence of innovation. Just to clarify that second question, innovation, as I would imagine, is, as you define, introducing new products and services, but one generally thinks of it as being an original idea or elements of originality. So I just wondered if counterfeiting and piracy factor in in any way. Uh, so it's very hard to measure counterfeiting directly because clearly we look at innovation, a broad-based uh, you know, approach. Uh, we do include inside a model elements about intellectual property payments or the proportion total trade which actually reflect you know, more genuine recognition of uh, IP property. At the same time, we also have inside the innovation model elements around online creativity of individuals. You know? So we measure online creativity of individuals not patented, but basically people creating content online and creating their and expressing their own creativity. So you know, there is a different elements of innovation we try and capture. If we had the right variables and data for countries on the aspects you mentioned, we would certainly look at waste included. There are many aspects on which you don't really have the right amount of data available today for the kind of country coverage we seek in the report. Have to wrap up. We have to, okay, quick yeah, follow up. Yeah, uh, Professor Duta, following up to William's uh, comment, you said, you, you have problems uh, measuring uh, counterfeit or pirate products, but um, it seems to be a wealth of information in customs databases, and that research is being done by the OECD. So I'm a bit puzzled why you're not doing it. So what I would say is that, A, we look at innovation in a much more broad-based phenomena across society. And B, I think certainly we look at the different data variables and we have certain minimum thresholds of coverage that we expect from the database. So we're happy to consider whatever variables you might want to suggest and we look at that in the future. And just to add, John, we are doing it at WIPO. Carsten Fink's outfit has looked at the methodology and uh, worked uh, with the OECD in respect of this. Uh, but the question is, it's relevance to innovation capacity here. Okay, we'll take one last question from the Kuwait News Agency. Yes, Tamar from Kuwait News Agency. I see here that uh, Kuwait is ranked uh, uh, 56. Uh, that means they uh, moved 11 positions up from last year. What does it mean for the country like Kuwait and the region? It is a challenge or it is an opportunity? Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, indeed, the, uh, the change is quite uh, remarkable. Uh, we always caution uh, observers about uh, reading too much in year-to-year -year changes. Uh, it's safer to look at moving average, let's say, for a period of three to five years. Uh, the case of Kuwait is interesting because we see that the GCC area right now um, exhibits a quite a high level of divergence in performance. Uh, we have parts of the world where the majority of countries moves up or the majority of countries move down. Uh, this year, at least for the GCC, we have a split between countries who move up quite significantly, like Kuwait and others who move down. Uh, we would suggest to uh, let it rest two or three years to see where the things stabilize. But clearly, this is a positive and encouraging sign regarding Kuwait.